Should Christians celebrate Christmas? Or, how should a Christian celebrate Christmas? Inevitably, once we Christians receive our salvation when we are born again by grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as babies in Christ, we are drawn to the life-saving, water of the Word and the Bible to grow into mature Christians. There is no doubt that Christians will run into a myriad of opinions regarding the Christmas celebration, and once we understand or, more aptly stated, are convinced of a viewpoint that we consider Bible truth, we apply that to our new lives as new creatures in Christ. One of the biggest conundrums we will run into are the questions previously mentioned. The purpose of this Bible study is to rightly divide the word of truth by presenting the argument both for and against the Christmas celebration, and with all said information, discern truth from what is really a blessed problem for the Christian struggling with this question. If you are wrestling with this question then you are most likely on a good path in your Christian walk because you are wishing to please God, not only by controlling your thoughts, but also how you present yourself to the world. No one wants to be seen as materialistic or pagan or sacrilegious when we are pressing towards perfection, so how do we rightly represent ourselves to the best of our ability to our brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as the unbelieving corrupt and fallen world we are traversing through in our earth suits? Many believers dislike the season and have refused to celebrate it at all. A number of reasons are given, and while some of their concerns and reasons offered against the observance of Christmas may be compelling, are they really Bible truth or interpretations of biblical passages that read in our preconceived perspective on the subject? I am no exception. As I was growing in Christ, I ran across the usual suspects that denounced the Christmas celebration as heretical and pagan and an abomination to the Lord that will lead me straight to hell in a handbasket if I were to participate. As a person with an open mind to truth while being guarded against its manipulation through Holy Spirit discernment, the following arguments are what one will be presented with. Jeremiah 10 2-4, which reads. Thus says the Lord. Do not learn the way of the Gentiles, do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. For the customs of the peoples are futile, for one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold, they fasten it with nails and hammers, so that it will not topple. Also you will come across this quote in Isaiah 44 14-15 which reads. He cuts down cedars for himself, and takes the cypress and the oak, he secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself, yes, he kindles it and bakes bread indeed he makes a god and worships it, he makes it a carved image, and falls down to it. Finally, you may also be confronted with this quote Jeremiah 3.13. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice says the Lord. It seems the points of reference for this were two, wood cut from the forest, they decorate it with silver and gold, he plants a fir, an evergreen tree, scattered your charms, under every green tree, and, falls down before it. They go on to say, that at Christmas people take an evergreen tree cut from the forest, they decorate it with ornaments of silver and gold, and then fall down before it when they place their presence under the tree. The conclusion is that this is idolatry. It is this mentality that we should address in this study. How should believers respond to such questions and to the criticism leveled against the celebration of Christmas and the Christmas season? Is it scripturally wrong to celebrate Christmas? Is it pagan? Everywhere we go during the season, the signs of Christmas are there with all their glitter, tinsel lights, greenery, cards, festivities, carols, bells, Santas, manger scenes, angels, trees and presents, and the push by Madison Avenue and the gimmicks of the retailers. The Christmas season either makes or breaks many businesses, and frankly, many churches as well. Should we play the part of Scrooge and say, bah humbug? Should we call attention to the fact that certain of our Christmas traditions such as the Yule Log, the Decorated Tree, and Mistletoe, each have their roots in pagan festivals? Should we assert that to celebrate Christmas is to promote paganism and materialism, and thus is just not the biblical thing to do?
Should our Holy Spirit discernment be triggered as to question the motivation of those that only use Old Testament scripture as a guideline for the Christian walk under the New Covenant? Arguments against a celebration of Christmas. Argument number one. Christmas is commercialized and materialistic. It is said that because the birth of Christ has been commercialized and secularized, the real meaning of the season has been lost. For the most part this is true. Even the story about the birth of Christ is often distorted, mocked, or misrepresented. The meaning of Christmas is said to be the spirit of giving. However, the giving of the Son of God who became the babe of the cradle that he might become the man of the cross and one day reign on earth with the crown is forgotten, rejected, or ignored. The counterpoint here is that if we use this argument as a legitimate reason for discarding the entire celebration of Christ's birth at Christmas, it would follow that we would end up having to throw out everything, even our Bibles and our wives or husbands. Why? Because Satan and man distort and ruins everything in life. The Bible, sex, marriage, food, the church visible meaning, the physical church we go to rather than the body of Christ, that comprises all those saved by grace. Name one thing that Satan doesn't ruin. We don't throw things out just because the world misuses or distorts them. In 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Paul says, abstain from every form of evil in the NKJV. Because of the translation of the KJV, every appearance of evil, some have taken this to apply to anything that even looks like it might be evil. As the NKJV translation makes clear, however, Paul's meaning is to abstain from every genuine form of evil, not what might simply appear to be evil. We are to abstain from what is genuinely evil or wrong, according to the index of the Word of God. To abstain from the mere appearance of evil would seem to contradict what the Apostle says in the second passage important to this discussion. In Titus 1.15 the Apostle also warns against those who see evil in almost anything and condemn it. For these people, a lot of things have the appearance of evil, but purity is first of all a matter of the mind and conscience, not merely the external. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, Nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. Just because the world distorts something, that does not make it evil if we avoid the distortions and use it as God intended or in a way that does not go contrary to God's character and holiness. A good illustration is the beauty of sexual love within the bonds of marriage. Argument number two. Scripture doesn't authorize it. The argument is that since we are not clearly authorized by the Bible to celebrate the birth of Christ during such a season, we should have no celebrations or even special services to commemorate the birth of Christ. On the other hand, scripture does tell us to remember his death in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, and a lot of the church visible celebrate his resurrection by assembling on the first day of the week, but there is no precedent for celebrating his birth. This is what we could legitimately call hyperliteralism in the use of scripture. Such an approach completely misses the spirit and intent of the Bible. Hyperliteralism, legalism, or letterism, is an intense devotion to the details of the Bible in such a way that one misses the spirit and essential thrust of a passage. Mountains are made out of molehills, and the truth is missed. One is busy counting the number of letters in a sentence, rather than listening to its instruction provided therein. Do not get me wrong here, I am not promoting the practice of reading whatever you want into scripture to fit your point of view, but often, very often, what you find in the professing body of Christ, are those who are missing the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and as such, the things of the Spirit, taught in the Bible, are foolishness to them as found in 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If we applied this argument consistently, we would need to discontinue the use of musical instruments, hymnals, chorus books, the church building, pews, Sunday school, Christian schools, and many other things that when used with the correct Christian mindset, are beneficial to the church and church, visible for the great commission to spread the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Further, there could be no special services or seasons to commemorate things God has done as with thanksgiving. Why? Because the only illustrations of such things are found in the Old Testament and not the New Testament. If the New Testament had clearly spoken on this matter, this argument would be correct because the New Testament does take priority over the Old Testament. 
However, since it is not, the argument from silence is not sufficient reason. Some would argue that the New Testament has not been silent, and this is the third argument we need to consider. Argument number three. Scripture forbids it. Colossians 2 16-17 So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Using this passage, it is claimed that Scripture actually warns and forbids the observance of any special months, seasons, days or religious festivals. The counterpoint is, what Colossians 2 16-17 forbids is the celebration of religious seasons or holy days, when they have been prescribed as religious duty and necessary for holiness or spirituality. In this passage, the Apostle is talking about the Old Testament festivals which were shadows of the person and work of Christ, but Christ has now come. To continue to celebrate them is to dishonor the fact of His coming, or to act as though He were not enough for salvation or spirituality. Note what the Apostle says, let no one act as your judge in regard to. He is saying don't let anyone tell you these things are requirements for fellowship with God. They were only shadows of the person and work of Christ, and he has not only come and fulfilled those shadows, but he is totally sufficient. Colossians 2 16 and 17 in no way forbids believers from commemorating something such as the birth of Christ, if it is done out of love, devotion, and the joy the season gives, when used as a way of focusing on the Savior, and not as a religious duty. The issue is not the observance, but the reason, the attitudes and the spirit in which it is done. The word spirit in this last sentence cannot be emphasized enough because that is where Judaizers and others totally miss many critical points for Christians under the liberty of the new covenant, rather than the laws of sin and death as we see in Romans 8 2. An additional counterpoint to the argument that scripture does not permit it that is put forward is that there is a case to be made there is scriptural precedent for commemorating and remembering the birth of Christ. This is in keeping with the events that occurred around the time of Christ's birth these include. 1. The appearance of the angel of the Lord with the glory of the Lord to announce the birth of Christ to the shepherds as seen in Luke 2 10-12. 2. The response of the angels at the announcement of Christ's birth is noted in Luke 2 13-14. 3. The actions of the shepherds who left their flocks to go and see which was nothing short of a celebration in Luke 2 15-20. 4 and the arrival of the men from the east bearing gifts as much as a year to two years later seen in Matthew 2 1 to 12. There is, of course, the New Testament precedent for believers meeting together on Sunday. In essence this is a celebration of the Lord's resurrection or beginning of the church age. The early church automatically did this, but scripture does not command us to do so. In fact, the early church at first met daily and took the Lord's Supper daily, but we don't do that today. Why not? Because these are not binding. We are not under the law. Most of the church visible meet on Sunday because of its significance and because the early church set a precedent for it, but it was never commanded in the Bible. Believers did it out of love and adoration for the risen Savior. The same argument against Christmas are often, as one may notice, argued by the same Judaizers who wish to pick and choose from the Old Testament laws of Moses and traditions, rather than living under the laws of Christ, laws of love and the spirit of the new covenant. We do not celebrate the day, we celebrate every day as new creatures in Christ. The point is this. If the early church could celebrate the resurrection without a specific command from God, only the spirit of legalism or the letter of the law would forbid the celebration of Christ's birth as a special season of joy and adoration. Ultimately, the issue is not the season, it's the attitude and reason behind it and the distortion of it. Let's not throw out the baby Jesus with the wash. Argument number four. Christmas traditions are from paganism. Another argument against the celebration of Christmas as it has been done for years is the claim that many of the traditions found in the celebration of Christmas were brought over into Christianity from pagan practices. These include the Yule log, the tree, special feasts or meals and mistletoe. How can we justify these things? Isn't it just like celebrating Halloween? A number of Old Testament passages are sometimes used to condemn the use of Christmas trees such as Jeremiah 10 2-5 Isaiah 40 19 to 20, 44 14 to 17, which were quoted at the beginning of this study. 
A counterpoint to this argument can be pointed out in some historical facts about our traditions. The Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible says, Gradually a number of prevailing practices of the nations into which Christianity came were assimilated and were combined with the religious ceremonies surrounding Christmas. The assimilation of such practices generally represented efforts by Christians to transform or absorb otherwise pagan practices. The Feast of Saturnalia in early Rome, for example, was celebrated for seven days from the 17th to the 24th of December and was marked by a spirit of merriment, gift-giving to children, and other forms of entertainment. Gradually, early Christians replaced the pagan feast with the celebration of Christmas, but many of the traditions of this observance were assimilated and remain to this day a part of the observance of Christmas. Other nations, the Scandinavians, Germans, French English and others, have left their mark as well. Concerning these ancient elements, the Christian Encyclopedia says, Various symbolic elements of the pagan celebration, such as the lighting of candles, evergreen decorations, and the giving of gifts, were adapted to Christian signification. Later as Christianity spread into Northern Europe, the Celtic, Teutonic, and Slavic winter festivals contributed holly, mistletoe, the Christmas tree, bonfires, and similar items. Finally, Unger's Bible Dictionary adds, The giving of presents was a Roman custom, while the Yule tree and Yule log are remnants of old Teutonic nature worship. Gradually the festival sank into mere revelry. The custom was forbidden by an act of parliament in 1555, and the Reformation brought in a refinement in the celebration of Christmas by emphasizing it Christian elements. But what about passages like Jeremiah 10? Some believe this condemns the celebration of Christmas and especially the use of the Christmas tree. Is Jeremiah telling us to avoid the customs of the nations? No. Jeremiah 10 is a denunciation of the making and worship of idols and not the decoration of evergreen trees in the home. This passage is not a categorical denial of all the customs of the nations. It is only a command to avoid those customs that are contrary to the revelation of God to Israel. There were many customs that Israel and the nations had in common that were not wrong. This passage in Jeremiah and others like it in Isaiah had to do with idolatry. First, Jeremiah warns against astrological worship, the worship of the sun, moon, and the stars. Second, he warns against going into the forest to cut down trees to be carved into an idol in some form, whether human or animal, and then worshipped and prayed to for guidance, for protection, and blessing that is cross-referenced in Isaiah 44 14-17. Some have tried to tie the reference to the green tree in Jeremiah 3 6, 13, to the reference in 10 3, to further justify condemnation of the Christmas tree, but this refers to the idolatrous groves of trees used as a place for idol worship and revelry. The modern-day equivalent of this is the global elite meeting in the Californian forest, famously known as the Bohemian Club. It has been exposed in a documentary called Dark Secret Inside Bohemian Grove, in which we find out that during this highly secretive meeting, a ceremony known as the cremation of care is performed that these occultist believes washes away their sins or cares by projecting them onto a um avatar of a child as seen here. The full video will be linked in the comments. <laughs> Thou shalt destroy. But this too we know. 
year after year within this happy throne, our fellowship bends thee for a space. Thy malevolence which would pursue us here has lost its power under these friendly trees. So shall we burn thee once again this night, and in the flames that eat thine effigy, we shall read the sign, Midsummer sets us free! What are some of the issues facing us today? 1. The pagan associations were lost long ago. The names of the days of our week also had their origin in pagan beliefs. Thursday originally stood for the Germanic god of the sky or of thunder. Tuesday stood for Tu, the god of war. And Wednesday is derived from Woden, the chief god in Germanic mythology. Sunday and Monday were related somehow to the worship of the sun and the moon. Saturday is from Saturnus or Saturn, and Friday comes from Freya, the goddess of love. All of these ancient meanings with their beliefs and associations were lost long ago. When Friday rolls around we don't think about Freya, the goddess of love. On Saturday we don't think about it as Saturn's day, but as our day off, in most cases. The same applies to the traditions of Christmas. If one observed the days of the week or the Christmas season with their ancient associations in mind, certainly it would be 110% wrong. But many of these things, as with our Sunday, have been given Christian connotations. The evergreen tree is a symbol of the eternal life which Christ, the Son of God, offers to man via another tree, the cross is noted in Revelation 2 7, 22 2, and 14. The presence under the tree can remind us of God's gift and our need to give of ourselves to others, as those who have received God's gift of life through Christ. Even without seeking special significance in the traditions of Christmas, you could still celebrate this season for the joy and family fun the season can bring. It can be suggested that believers can capitalize on the Christmas season as a family tradition and as a learning experience, much like the Old Testament Passover was to be used by Israel as well as to spread the good news of Jesus Christ by talking about his birth and life and death and God's plan to save us. It all depends on the spirit and attitude in which it is done. We can be very negative and critical, or we can be positive and use the season as a time to remember and commemorate the birth of the Savior. We can use it as a time to demonstrate love for others in a special way, and to be together as a family like we do on Thanksgiving, the 4th of July, or New Year's. We can make something evil out of it or something good. 2. Facts of Scripture Concerning the Celebration of Christmas In view of what we have seen, the Bible is silent from the standpoint of our Christmas traditions. However, because of our freedom in Christ under grace, we are at liberty to celebrate Christmas. The important point is that the Bible simply does not condemn the celebration of Christmas even in the traditional form, and we have liberty in Christ to choose to do so. Scripture does, however, set down principles which should affect the way we celebrate it. These principles warn and protect us from the distortions we find in the world. Today in many companies and offices, Christmas is celebrated with wild, drunken parties where there is no regard for the reason for the season, the birth of the Savior of the world. It becomes just a time of merriment and a time to tie one on. Today people often spend lavishly on gifts and go deeply in debt. They buy things they can't afford, which nobody needs, and sometimes can't even identify. The response is hey, thanks. What is it? Children get caught up with the gifts and toys, and lose sight of the Savior lore never hear about the Lord as God's gift of His Son, that we might have life. Through the Christmas message, parents often fail to teach the spirit of giving as an outworking of one's relationship with God through faith in Christ, God's gift to the world. Finally, some may observe the season as they would observe Lent, as a religious holy day that must be observed to gain points with God or to become more spiritual. But it doesn't have to be like this. Even the gift aspect can be done in such a way that it is instructive, meaningful, in keeping with one's budget, and in keeping with biblical teaching concerning Christian stewardship. 3. Ancient traditions are often distortions of original revelation. Many of the customs of Christmas originated in ancient Babylonian paganism and were related in various ways to the mother-child cult. But an important concept is often missed here. Originally, many of the ideas of these pagan practices may have had their roots in the truth of the Old Testament or divine revelation from God as 
In Genesis 3.15, we have the promise of the Savior through the seed of a woman. In Isaiah 7.14, we have the promise that this Savior will come through the virgin birth. A number of passages use the symbol of a tree to point to the promise of life through the Messiah. Genesis 2.9. 317 and 22, Revelation 2 7. 22 2 and 14 all speak of a tree of life, some historic, some prophetic. Isaiah 4 2. 11 1. 60 21. Jeremiah 23 5. 33 15. And Zechariah 3 8 and 6 12 all speak of the branch of the Lord as the work of God. These verses form a whole line of prophecies concerning the branch of the Lord, the shoot, that would spring forth and become a tree of life both to Israel and the nations. So, when we come to the New Testament, we find a reference to a tree of life that is available to believers in Christ. In view of these Old Testament prophecies, four things may become evident. These ancient customs of the nations were originally introduced into the religious life of the nations by Satan to distort the original promises and truth of God which these customs would portray. For instance, in the mother-child cult of ancient Babylon, the mother was the primary object of worship, not her son. This was a distortion of the promise of Genesis 3.15. These customs came from a basic need in man, one built in by God, for the truth and need of a savior. The practices, though in perverted form, did portray a deliverer, the provision of eternal life, the gift of God through the seed of a woman, a divine branch from heaven, as the means of reconciliation to God. The principle is that these customs cast surprising light on the revelation of God's grace, as they originally came from God in the beginning of human history. As with the story of the flood, the temptation, and the fall of man, they all became perverted from that which we find in the inspired word. However, in many cases, they did point to original revelation from God and maybe even customs that were originally pure. Today, our Christmas traditions have lost their original pagan significance or connotations. In some cases, the distortions were corrected by the reformers over 200 years ago, but they did not see fit to condemn the celebration of Christmas. 4. The celebration of Christmas falls under the category of doubtful things. Most importantly, since scripture does not clearly rule out the celebration of Christmas, its celebration falls under the category of debatable or doubtful things, covered by the principles of Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. I encourage the viewer to read these chapters on your own, but in summary, these passages teach us the following principles. Every believer must become convinced in his or her own mind as seen in Romans 14:5. We must not judge or look upon other with contempt who do not come to the same conclusion that we do as noted in Romans 14 3, 4, and 13. Just as there is nothing evil in meat sacrificed to idols, so there is nothing inherently evil in the traditional Christmas with the tree, presents, carols, and decorations. Such things become what people make them by their attitudes and beliefs as discussed in Romans 14.22-23 and 1 Corinthians 8.4-8 and 10.19. The ultimate issue is our attitude, the reasons, and how if one decides to celebrate the Christmas season in some fashion. 5. Some options to consider. If you have doubts or misgivings, do away with any observance of the Christmas season altogether. But do not become a Scrooge and look down on those who do celebrate it as noted in Romans 14. Cut out some or all of the traditional elements like the tree, presents, etc., but spend the season reflecting on the birth of the Savior through the word and the singing of carols. Keep the season's traditions, the tree, presents, and decorations, but divorce them of any religious tones. Use this part of the season simply as a family tradition for fun and family togetherness. But remember the birth of Christ through carols, reading the Christmas story, and times with other members of the body of Christ. Keep the Christmas traditions and use them to illustrate and focus on the truth of Jesus Christ. 1. The tree speaks of the Lord and the eternal life which he gives. 2. The presents speak of God's love and gift to us of his Son, and of our love for one another. Make the emphasis more on giving rather than receiving. 3. The mistletoe speaks of the gift of God's righteous branch, and the kisser hug stands for kissing the Son in faith and expression of faith in Christ, as God's means of salvation and reconciliation as noted in Psalm 2. The problem is that many believers are already carnal or marginal in their spiritual life, 
and they get caught up in the rat race and secularization of the season. People spend far more than they can afford. They seek relief from their burdens and seek happiness in the glitter and merry-making of the holidays, rather than in the person of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. They look for the season to give joy, rather than the person of the season. They expect from the season what only God can give. As a result, depression and suicide reaches its peak during the Christmas season, and immediately following it. Argument number 5. Uncertainty of the date of Christ's birth. Jesus Christ entered into the history of our world, Christianity, therefore, has historical basis. The backbone of history is chronology. Whereas history is a systematic account of events in relation to a nation, institution, science, or art, chronology is a science of time. It seeks to establish and arrange the dates of past events in their proper sequence. Thus chronology serves as a necessary framework upon which the events of history may be fitted. The argument is that Christ could not have been born on December 25th or even in the winter, so the entire celebration is wrong, even the time of the year. Some put forth the following counterpoint that by considering the chronological notes in scripture such as Luke 2 1, it seems that the evidence would lead one to conclude that Christ's birth occurred sometime in the winter of 2-1 BC. Our concern here is not with the year, but with the month Christ was born, or at least the time of year, winter or spring. Is a fall or winter date out of the question? Is it possible or maybe even probable? The traditional date for the birth of Christ as December 25th dates back to as early as Hippolytus, 8D 165-235. In the Eastern Church January 6th was the date used for Christ's birth. But this is still a winter date and not far removed from December 25th. Chrysostom, AD 345-407, in 386, stated that December 25th is the correct date, and hence it became the official date for Christ's birth, except in the Eastern Church which still retained January 6th. One of the main objections has been that sheep were usually taken into enclosures from November through March and were not out in the fields at night. However, this is not as conclusive as it sounds for the following reasons. It could have been a mild winter. It is not at all certain that sheep were always brought into enclosures during the winter months. It is true that during the winter months sheep were brought in from the wilderness, but remember, Luke tells us the shepherds were near Bethlehem rather than in the wilderness. This indicates, if anything the nativity was in the winter months. The Mishnah tells us the shepherds around Bethlehem were outside all year, and those worthy of the Passover were nearby in the fields at least 30 days before the feast, which could be as early as February. One of the coldest, rainiest months of the year. So December is a very reasonable date. James Kelso, an archaeologist who spent a number of years living in Palestine and who has done extensive research there says this. The best season for the shepherds of Bethlehem is the winter when heavy rains bring up a luscious crop of new grass. After the rains the once barren, brown desert earth is suddenly a field of brilliant green. One year when excavating at New Testament Jericho, I lived in Jerusalem and drove through this area twice every day. At one single point along the road, I could see at times as many as five shepherds with their flocks on one hillside. One shepherd stayed with his flock at the same point for three weeks, so lush was the grass. But as soon as the rains stopped in the spring, the land quickly took on its normal desert look once again. Since there seemed to have been a number of shepherds who came to see the Christ child, December or January would be the most likely months. Argument number 6. The timing of the Magi's arrival. It has been claimed the Magi could not have arrived in Bethlehem at the time of Christ's birth. It would have taken months to travel to Bethlehem from the east. The family was living in a house when the Magi arrived, and Herod had children killed up to two years old when he heard about the child. While none of this really affects whether one should celebrate Christmas, this argument is often used to throw further doubt and contempt for the entire tradition of celebrating Christmas. As a counterpoint to this, the argument concerning the time required to travel from the east assumes a great deal. It assumes they were in the east when the star was seen, or even that God had not revealed information to them, which could have caused them to begin their journey before the star was seen. The question arises whether Matthew is speaking of the same time as Luke or a later time. 
Many attempt to demonstrate that the Magi visited Christ when he was about two years of age by noting that the Lucan narrative uses the term griefos in Luke 2.12, which is used to refer to an unborn and newborn child or an infant, whereas Matthew uses the words padian in Matthew 2.8. 9. 11. 13. 14. 20 and 21, and pace in Matthew 2.16 which are used of a child that is at least one year old, rather than an infant. The fact that the wise men came to the house, in Matthew's account, rather than a manger, in Luke's account, would also indicate that Jesus was older when Herod slew the children. Thus Luke is talking about the time of Christ's birth, whereas Matthew is talking about two years after Christ's birth. However, the distinction is not so clear-cut as some would have one to believe. The term, Padian is used of infants in, Luke 1 59, 66, 76, John 16 21 and Hebrews 11 23, and the word, Briefos is used of a young child in, 2 Timothy 3 15. The word, Pace, is used in the New Testament of a child 6 out of 24 times, the other 18 occurrences speak of a servant. In the Old Testament, the meaning, servant, is almost unanimous. In Matthew 2.16, pace would fall into the same age category as padian, since the latter term is used nine times in the same context. Furthermore, to say that Jesus was no longer an infant because the Magi visited him in a house rather than a stable is quite weak. Certainly they would have moved to a house as soon as it was possible. Indeed the tone of Matthew 2.1 is that the Magi visited Christ soon after his birth. That Herod killed children up to two years old was only to be sure he got Jesus. This is not out of character with Herod. Therefore, the slaying of the children soon after Christ's birth is tenable. Into the house. The child. These words need not indicate that the wise men came some time after the birth of Christ. The family would naturally have moved into a house as quickly as possible after Jesus was born, and child can mean a newborn as seen in John 16 21. We do not know how many wise men there were, gold and frankincense and myrrh. These were gifts worthy of a king. The early church fathers understood the gold to be symbolic of Christ's deity, the frankincense of his purity, and the myrrh of his death since it was used for embalming. Argument number seven. Christmas means Christ's mass. The name Christmas is objected to because it means Christ's Mass. This is supposed to be a reference to the Roman Catholic ritual involving the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. Roman Catholic tradition holds that by the priest's consecration the bread and the wine are changed into the literal body and blood of Christ, that this consecration is a new offering of Christ's sacrifice, and that by partaking of the elements the communicant receives saving and sanctifying grace from God. The counterpoint to this is that Christ plus Mass can also mean a large number or quantity. It can also mean simply a mass of religious services in commemoration of the birth of Christ. In other words, Mass stands for festival involving a number of religious activities and is not a reference to the Roman Catholic ritual of the Eucharist. Further, even if the term originally referred to the Roman Catholic ritual of the Eucharist, it long ago lost that connotation and is really not an issue. Argument number 8. What about Santa Claus? Christmas can involve children in the belief of Santa Claus, a mythical figure, which detracts from the person of Christ. The objection is that the emphasis is turned from Jesus Christ to Santa Claus as the giver of gifts for good behavior, rather than God's gift of his son by grace through faith. Furthermore, young children sometimes confuse Santa with Jesus Christ since he knows when you've been sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you've been bad or good. The idea of gifts for good behavior can connote a reward for good deeds mentality, which is opposed to God's gift of his son through faith. Scripture does promise rewards for obedience. A counterpoint offered for this is that the Santa Claus idea originated with a man by the name of Saint Nicholas, who was the bishop of Myra and Lycia, in the area of present-day Turkey. He went about, often at night, giving gifts to poor and needy children. He later became the patron saint of children in the Roman Catholic Church. From here the story grew and became legend and country after country with various details were deleted and added as the legend of Saint Nick grew. So, how should believers handle it? Santa may be taken as a fairy tale idea like Alice in Wonderland or Jack and the Beanstalk. 
Children normally understand that Alice in Wonderland is only make-believe, a fairy tale. However, for many children Santa is real. In many ways it is probably harmless, but one should not encourage lying to your child about the existence of Santa Claus by stating it as fact. Parents need to be careful in their use of this part of Christmas and are more encouraged to focus on the meaning of Saint Nick being focused upon the needy. We also need to remember that scripture does promise rewards for godly behavior or faithfulness for believers in Christ. Salvation is a gift through faith alone in Christ alone, but crowns, symbolism for rewards, are promised for faithful and obedient living as noted in 1 Peter 5 4. To sum all this up, this is mostly a Western problem. We live in a time of relative luxury compared to most of human history, where the daily grind does not just involve trying to keep a shelter of some kind, clothes on our backs and food in our bellies, but provides the extras that are not needed but wanted. As with all of these doubtful things, each family needs to make up their own minds. Parents can explain the traditions and have fun with them, but make sure your children understand the historical roots and use these things to teach the truth behind the traditions. Make Jesus the focus of this time just as any other time, and appreciate all that God has blessed you with while connecting with others in fellowship to strengthen the body of Christ. There may be a time during the coming Great Tribulation that these worldly struggles will not seem so pressing, but one thing will remain, just as what we saw happening during World War II, when opposing forces would stop to celebrate December 25, the day will always be attributed from here on out to the birth of Jesus Christ and not a pagan celebration long ago. It is your duty to live in the Spirit, and with your liberty in Christ, you can decide whether you want to observe it or not but we are not to judge our brothers and sisters who celebrate it with the full focus on Christ, and not some pagan tradition co-opted by the Pope to bring people under the subjection of Roman Catholicism. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind, he who observes the day, observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's, for to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Romans 14 4-13. On screen are playlists and videos that one may enjoy for edification purposes and to assist in your spiritual growth. Please, like, comment, share and subscribe for more content. Merry Christmas to all those that celebrate it, but for everyone, we pray that God blesses you and yours with peace, love, grace and empathy every day and every season.